So thanks for being here. Um, I want to, yeah, as, as we mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about airflows um, of direct-to-shape printing. So you've been listening these days, I think, all the issues about going to direct-to-shape printing. We're going to talk a bit about that. So why airflows are important. There are two main um, uh, processing conditions, I would say, that could summarize why uh, airflows are important or why we suspected a while ago that they were having like, an important role, and that's uh, through distance and uh, speed. So uh, by that I mean that we, uh, as you've been listening again, we need to adapt to throw distances, generally increasing throw distances, just because of the uh, sort of materials we want to print. So we are talking about different types of corrugate materials or textiles. And we also need to adapt to the different speed that uh, the different customers have in their uh, production lines. So as a bit of an example of why these two things are quite important, <laughs> I have a sketch in which, again, uh, I'm showing that you shouldn't uh, basically uh, hit the, your printing uh, bar with your substrate, right? So it's obvious why we need to go uh, further and, again, potentially controlling uh, what happens with the speed or how it affects. So, uh, before I go for the next one, uh, we know again that increasing that throw distance tends to be uh, detrimental for the printing quality and uh, the correlation is not as clear for speed. So again, but we have a rough idea that both affect uh, the printing quality quite a lot and we can think that that's because of the air flows under the uh, print head. Right, so uh, I already presented here, two years ago actually, um, work that we did on flat surfaces. So uh, we used uh, a technique with a macro lens to visualize what was going on when printing, and uh, then uh, we could perform particle image velocimetry on, uh, on our images. That's, uh, well, a technique for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, a technique in which uh, you um, calculate the magnitude of the flow field um, that you are studying by comparing the motion of seed particles, that in this case we can see the, uh, that would be the ink. So you can compare the motion of those particles from one frame to another when you have a video. Um, so that gave us quite a lot of not only qualitative but quantitative information about what was going on. Uh, so again, we could um, have some, let's say, rough guidelines about what to avoid or what to try and do or to pursue in terms of um, achieving a good quality. So for instance, things to avoid, um, were, uh, we, see, we saw that there were uh, the developing of uh, eddies, uh, both up front the printing rows, as we can see here. So that's something that we should avoid. We saw that that was detrimental for the quality. And uh, there's also sometimes, uh, it kind of depends on the distance in between rows. You, have, you may have um, turbulence also in between printing rows. So that's also something we should avoid. And uh, so that's something that we saw for, for flat surfaces. And then uh, also um, we uh, realized that increasing the speed is not always bad. As, uh, some other studies had concluded, and actually yesterday uh, there was someone mentioning that for them, for the range they were studying, increasing the speed um, was detrimental for the quality. Uh, we've noticed that it depends, there's a balance of parameters there, but in general increasing the speed tends to be better to avoid turbulence, and then that's better for the, printing, for the final printed pattern. So again, that led us to um, think that decreasing the disruption of what I will call the entrained flow, and that's the flow which is generated when moving a substrate. So in this case, the substrate would be moving left to right. So that's kind of the sort of pattern that um, happens when we're moving in this direction. Um, so uh, decreasing the disruption on that generated flow because of that uh, motion would reduce the turbulence and that should be the way to go. So, uh, okay, so printing to flat is already quite complex, so why do we want to go for non-flat surfaces? Uh, well, as we said, materials, fast production lines, and now we are going more towards personalization of uh, our gifts, 
and uh, we know that um, in general personalization for let's say smaller things packaging like simple things is a big thing these days uh, for um, for inject but uh, actually this uh, project came more uh, from uh, uh, to study larger pieces of curved glass in which we want to um, embed uh, functionalities so uh, so I'll be uh, that's why I'll, I will be focusing more on, on curved surfaces So, uh, as for the physics, very quickly, um, there are three main phenomena that, that you should have in mind when printing. And these are, uh, the first one is kind of the um, generation of wakes because of the drops. So depending on the frequency, the size of the drops and so on, you will have different wakes. That generates a cross flow with that and train flow, which is basically what we call accurate flow. Uh, so that generates a cross flow situation. So that's something that one has to bear in mind. There is something going on here uh, with the encounter of those two flows. Then there is another thing, as we were mentioning before, turbulence. So th you could have flow disruption in between printing rows. So that's something that you also have to bear in mind and, and take into account. And there's also the behavior of the boundary layer, and it, this, of course, relates to how your drops are going to deposit um, and uh, adhere and so on, right? So, and then a fourth thing that is not so easy to control uh, are the random processes um, on the because of the printing environment, and I'll talk a bit more about this later. So I'm showing here a bit of a sketch of how the laboratory setup that we have looks like. So um, very easy, maybe you, you uh, remember about this for flat surfaces, but the idea is like we would be seeing our printing process from your um, perspective uh, with a high-speed camera. And uh, well, I shine with um, a laser light uh, the area in which you, we are going to be printing. Uh, that's monochromatic light, so it's very good for scattering of, of uh, the seeding particles or the uh, particles of ink. Then I can control the motion uh, and the speed of this moving substrate. Uh, I can change the, um, the shape of the substrate. And of course, uh, I can change kind of which sort of print heads uh, we use. So this would be more or less a concept of, I mean, it's, it's like a wind tunnel without a proper control section, because the section would be given in this particular area by the gap that, again, we're going to vary, and it's open towards the sides. So it's, it's not like a proper wind control tunnel, and that's one of the issues of Inject. We don't have like a proper control section when, when we are printing. So here there are some of the shapes that I'm going to show today in terms of uh, uh, printing. Uh, we have some more shapes. There are some there that are hidden because that's going to be a surprise for next year probably. But uh, <laughs> there are some shapes here um, that, uh, again, we've been testing and will be testing. Um, but yeah, so that you have a rough idea. Actually, I tested these two, now we will see, for single nozzle devices. And these are a bit chunkier, a bit wider. Uh, I tested these ones with uh, industrial scale uh, print heads. And actually, I have uh, one of the items around here, just in case you want to see how they look and the size. Uh, so OK, this is how it kind of looks. So <laughs> again, because I'm using laser light, um, everything is enclosed. So in this case, we'll actually have two different setups. One of them is slightly simpler. The laser is not as powerful. And this is uh, basically to run uh, a single nozzle device. And this is a second one. Uh, it's a bit bulkier. Uh, the laser is better, it's more powerful. And uh, in this case, well, we can see here the platform, the linear actuator, some sensing um, capabilities. And this is the one in which uh, I would be mounting somehow like the uh, industrial uh, scale pr printers or print heads. So in terms of the parameters I'm studying, the range of parameters, uh, we're studying different radii of curvature. Mostly, uh, we're focusing mostly on these uh, three uh, numbers at the moment. And we have again positive and negative combinations. 
of, of curvature. Then uh, I've been uh, studying um, substrate speed from 0.3 to 1.2 meters per second. So we are covering the, those sort of 50 meters per minute, 70 meters per minute, 75 um, that you generally encounter in, in uh, companies. Then uh, I have varied frequencies, number of rows that are printing, uh, the speed of the drops, and, and of course the gaps, especially when testing uh, the different um, curved shapes. We have a variable gap. And uh, well, in terms of the two different systems I mentioned before, um, the single nozzle device um, ejects quite a large size uh, drop as we can see there. And then the uh, industrial scale print head is, is more of the maybe of the range you're used to, to see. In terms of those who want to know a bit more about which sort of regimes, like flow regimes we're talking about, um, I just mentioned here uh, three main uh, regimes that we can see in terms of the physics. So that would be, as I mentioned before, the entrained flow. So we should have a fairly linear regime for those squared flows that I was mentioning before. Con well, this is considering, again, the gap. Um, there are more things going on, of course. Then the cross flow, if we consider uh, the Reynolds of the drops, that's about 10. So again, as we say, it's quite linear. And uh, this would be the estimated cross flow if we consider the wake of air somehow. Uh, produced by the drops. And here we would be in a turbulent regime. Uh, so we could potentially study, again, combinations of these flows in terms of simulation and all the calculations. Uh, so if you want to talk about this later, just let me know. Um, and then, OK, so we start here with the fun. So now you have to be with me, because we, we're going to start uh, talking about and analyzing the videos and talking about some concepts that we see when printing. So again, this is for the single nozzle device. So, uh, OK, let's see what happens for the uh, sort of shape in this sketch. That means uh, basically a continuous curvature, no changes in the curvature. Uh, so it should run like this. OK, so we can see something important that I will remember later. Uh, so we can see a bit of an entrained flow there against this flow that is uh, coming because of the uh, substrate. And again, we can see that our drops deviate as we expect in that sort of uh, uh, manner, in the direction of the entrained flow. And actually, again, I can repeat here, not to repeat the video, but at the beginning we saw a bit of an, a counter flow from one of the sides. That's kind of the random process I was mentioning before. You can have, like again, random flows around your printer that you may not uh, control. Uh, have control uh, over, and uh, then again at some point this entrained flow will start accelerating, and uh, it keeps it develops that quid flow, and it keeps on going uh, for the full uh, substrate that you were that we were studying, deviating uh, the drops in that direction. So what happens with this other? Uh, sort of shape in which we change the curvature somewhere there. We have like two peaks and a valley. So again, uh, the this pressure gradients different to what we have here. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So again, we can see again that sort of flow I was mentioning before. But again, the uh, substrate is again running in the same direction, and as we were mentioning, so we would expect that sort of uh, generation of the quid flow, and it's kind of, yeah, happening. It's deviating the drops in that direction that we're expecting. Um, this may be a bit long, let's see. So now, actually, we are getting, sorry because of the zoom, we're getting to the valley area, and then, yeah, and suddenly we have like a larger gap, there are changes in the uh, pressure, and that, that flow that we had before counteracting um, just seems to overtake and deviates the drops in the other direction, as you saw before. Then again, I don't know whether we can repeat this maybe, so it's a bit clearer now. So again, just very quickly, we can see again a bit of a counter flow at the beginning, that preferential flow. Then. Again, because of how yeah, the lens uh, can't really capture uh, a bigger window, but we would have uh, the substrate running. It generates that quid flow that we saw before because of an acceleration of the air coming in. 
And then at some point when we start getting to the valley with all those um, changes in the pressure, we have a bit of a recirculation of air also um, somehow we can add up that, that um, preferential flow and it ends up generating that sort of shear behavior in which the boundary layer is just like, again, attached to the solid, but then you have the other flow counteracting. So that means, again, that your drops get deviating in a, different, in a complete different way, an expected way. Uh, so again, in that particular case, I was printing, like the substrate was moving at something like 0.3 meters per second. Um, so that's relatively low. I guess it's about maybe 20 meters per minute or something like that. Um, but I also observed that same behavior for uh, printing substrates up to 0.9 meters per second even. So then, uh, because of the intensity of the light, I was a bit worried that maybe we couldn't perform PIV, meaning we would be losing a bit of those uh, quantitative details I was mentioning before. But yeah, uh, luckily we could do it. Uh, so we, we have more, again, more information uh, confirming what we could see with our naked eye. So again, those sort of shear regimes there with uh, uh, flows uh, in, in different directions. And we can also see some of the um, effects of that cross flow with the wake of a single drop, which again is, yeah. Going to see again. These drops are relatively bigger than the ones that we have in uh, in an industrial printer, but not much much bigger. We're still in the micro scale, so it's a it's a good thing to to be able to uh, visualize uh, that sort of behavior. So okay, so the conclusions kind of from the study of uh, single nozzle devices um, was basically that the shape and the flow history matters. And by flow history, I mean those preferential flows. So depending on how what's going on around your printer, even before your substrate gets there, uh, you, you can have different effects. So you can, again, develop that nice squared flow um, in the same direction of the entrained flow and everything. And then the drop will behave in a kind of expected manner. Or you can generate maybe, again, that squared flow close to the substrate but then your preferential flow will go against that, and that could potentially give rise to shear, um, shear flows there. And then again, as I was mentioning before, these sort of shapes with um, like larger pressure gradients tends to behave as we all uh, may expect in a, in a more complex uh, way. So again, not the best designs ever for that. But again, well, so let's see a uh, single nozzle. That's really important. It's, I would say, a comp complementary information to what then we have in an uh, uh, industrial scale print head, right? Because, of course, it's not the same having a single uh, drop somehow or just a single chain of drops compared to a whole array of, of drops. So, OK, so let's see what happens um, when we print like a full image, um, several nozzles. Uh, so same uh, sort of situation as before. This is the shape of the substrate I was testing, uh, running from uh, right to left. So when it encounters like the air, whatever that is, whether it's coming this way or whether it's quiescent air, um, Sorry, we, could, we can see an increase in the initial turbulence. So again, this is relatively important, but if you have like a wide um, printer, a wide format printer, this wouldn't be as important because, I mean, again, you wouldn't have this situation when you were in the area in which you print. Then after that, we have a sable region, which again, uh, it matches somehow with the uh, shortest um, gaps. And then we start developing uh, turbulence or what seems to be at least not uh, as a stable. So uh, this is a large drop uh, and it's about 0.8 uh, meters per second. Uh, so this is about 50 meters per minute. Uh, and again, these gaps uh, or the, yeah, the gap was from a one millimeter when, it's, uh, when we are at the top to 10 millimeters, to about 10 millimeters when we are at the edges. So, okay, so we've seen that. Let's see what happens when uh, we are printing. 
So again, remember, so we're moving this way. This is all this first region we saw with all uh, kind of all the uh, messy eddies like turbulence. Again, you are even like uh, your satellites are impacting uh, like uh, against the nozzle plate. But then when the gap uh, starts reducing, you get um, a more stable wet flow again. It develops uh, nicely there. And well, uh, you have, let's say, you have problems with your satellites, but seems seems to be qu quite okay. However, you may have realized how this eddy here disappeared at some point in which uh, when we had like a very um, short gap, but then at some point it started developing again. Meaning, if I think about when I was working with flat surfaces, as I mentioned before, there was a critical situation when uh, you would distort that entrain flow too much, so that, again, your second rows or your uh, consecutive rows would get that sort of, those sort of eddies, even when you have managed to avoid them in a first instance for the first rows. So again, I said, OK, maybe uh, oh, what can be happening here, as I mentioned, that turbulence, stable region in which there is that stabilization of the flow and an acceleration of the entrain flow. We don't have that uh, leading uh, eddy, um, but not on the first row, but then we, see, we still see it on the second row. And then, well, at the end, we have like uh, di quite decelerated droplets uh, when we're about 9 to 10 millimeters. And we, we definitely know that's going to be a bit difficult, right? So coming back at a bit of the hypothesis, we think uh, it's happening here. It's mostly uh, what we think could be a victory effect. Meaning, again, in this region, actually, we have lower pressure in comparison to, uh, to the uh, larger uh, gaps regions when talking about the airflow. So that means that the air that is at higher pressure would, like, especially for the uh, entrained air who's coming behind, yeah, that would um, be entrained in, the, uh, in, the, in this region at an accelerating rate. Uh, and that produces, again, that acceleration and, and stabilization of the flow. So I said, what happens if I decrease that disruption by uh, the, the disruption in the entrain flow by decreasing the drop size and the number of printing drops? And actually, what happened, so again, we increased a bit the uh, initial turbulence region, which is not as critical as I mentioned before, but then the stable region increased quite a lot. And then quite at the end, we had like, again, drop deceleration and they are going to fly because they are smaller droplets um, and so on and so forth. So let's see what happens here. So our substrate coming here, we can see a bit, sorry about the shades, that's because of the laser and the arrangement of the light. But we could see at the beginning some mess around there, but then suddenly this flow is uh, accelerated. It generates like a nice quad flow. No eddy in the first row, no eddy in the second row. Everything is quite symmetric in behavior. And again, quite here, we have like satellites and you, not even your main drops are touching the substrate. But again, it's, I don't know whether, yeah. So definitely there's a big difference in between the two of them. Is that kind of turbulence that we generate uh, in kind of the uh, uh, region in between the lines. And definitely that makes two, that seems to make a difference if I come back in the sort of pattern that we, we can print on. And yeah, so then very quickly, because I don't have the time, I was going to <laughs> show here a video, which is again, I'm not going, I, I wasn't going to explain uh, in, in much detail, but basically this sort of shape that I thought was going to be a bit dodgy, again, in the sense of we change curvature, there's a bit of a corner there. Actually, it's not too bad when printing, and actually there's not much of uh, turbulence. So again, I won't show it, but I can show later if someone is interesting is interested, sorry. <laughs> so then uh, the, uh, so conclusion, the design matters, definitely. And I tested some other things. You can see again how you can combine to have roughly a similar coverage. You could combine different, um, combi you could do different combinations of parameters and you can get uh, 
similar results in terms of coverage, but uh, uh, you can improve the the quality of the uh, of the image. However, there are again there are some designs that are quite quite difficult to to address, and uh, and again so. The general idea, actually, and the conclusions kind of to go towards some guidelines in helping designing strategies to print on these complex surfaces. After seeing all these videos, I hope you have a better idea about how we should go for a systemic approach, like considering all those parameters that we have. The general idea would be like disrupt the entrained flow uh, as like the least as possible, right? And then in terms of how that translates to practical uh, behavior, uh, higher speed tends to help, because again, we avoid those eddies in the rules. Then again, uh, we should be maybe thinking about a particular image, uh, trying to change during that image, kind of the size of the drops, the frequency of those drops, the nozzle pitch, the combination of rows, even to print one single image. That means that we need more and faster data flows, and that links to software uh, engineering and so on. But again, it could be the way to go, just like depending on the gaps you're encountering, the sort of corners, you could maybe need to do that. Um, so we should be thinking more about, again, how to integrate everything. And then um, if you could have a say on the design of the items, that would be great. Like, again, if you know the final application and you know you have certain flexibility to change the sort of curvature or the corners and so on, that, that would be great because you can correlate with, with, again, as we were saying before, with all the different, uh, 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 different behaviors. And uh, yeah, and then of course for large um, scale um, pieces, you may need to move the print head. That means that there are some other things that will get into uh, in, into the game, like the angle of approach. So again, it's like a bunch of parameters, but there are things, there are patterns there. There are things that we can extrapolate uh, from uh, from uh, these sort of uh, techniques. So yeah, that's all. Sorry, I think I, I don't know how much I overrun. I have not. Oh, okay, perfect. I thought I was really bad. <laughs>